It's the sound of ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Good morning and thanks so much for joining us. Yesterday, former President Donald Trump was held in contempt and fined $9,000 for repeatedly violating a gag order. He was warned that he could go to jail if he continued to attack witnesses and jurors. The former president has a history of attacking those involved in his legal proceedings, including disparaging judges overseeing his criminal and civil cases, a strategy that some see as a concerted attempt to delegitimize the court system while he undergoes multiple trials at the same time as he runs for a second term as president. His legal team argues that Trump has clear right to protecting his speech as a citizen and as a presidential candidate. But legal experts say his actions are contributing to an overall growing distrust of the judicial system and undermining the safety of the people sworn to uphold the rule of law and their families. A Washington Post analysis of Trump's social media posts says he's gone after judges or their family members by name 138 times. And a Reuters analysis found that threats against federal judges as a whole have more than doubled since late 2020. To begin today's program, we'll talk to two federal judges in Ohio about Trump's actions and the broader issue of judicial safety, as well as the public perception of the court system. Joining me in person in the studio for this conversation are two judges from the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Judge Dan Polster, thanks so much for coming in. You're welcome, Jenny. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. And Judge J. Philip Calabrese, thanks so much for being here. Good morning. Glad to have both of you. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Now, I want to note that both of you were appointed to your positions by presidents of different parties. Judge Polster, you were appointed by President Bill Clinton. Judge Calabrese, you were appointed by President Trump. But you're both here to talk about how judicial safety is not a partisan issue. I'd love to start with you, Judge Calabrese. Uh, Well, good morning. It's good to be able to be a part of this conversation with you and your listeners. Uh, Because of the uh, ethical rules that govern what uh, judges can comment on in terms of pending cases and the like, I'm not going to talk about uh, specific uh, cases that might be pending. But what I will say is that what I have seen uh, in the time I've been on the bench, it's not as long as my colleague here, but uh, approaching five years at this point, uh, what we see is part of a, a growing trend, in my view, and a, uh, a growing problem across the political spectrum. There are uh, powerful people and influential people uh, in positions of authority who uh, believe that uh, uh, delegitimizing the courts, attacking judicial independence, uh, somehow serves their political ends. And uh, you see the consequences of that every day. We just had, uh, you raised the issue of judicial safety. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've had only the second uh, attempted assassination of a sitting Supreme Court justice in our nation's history. Mm. Uh, so the threats are very real. And, and Judge Polster, would you add to that? Uh, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. Um, I echo what my colleague said. Um, you know there are there are countries around the world where judges live in fear. I I spoke to judges in Guatemala a few years ago, um, and there are sadly countries around the world where there is a great deal of judicial corruption. I helped train judges in Moldova, and that they came out of the Soviet system, and the judicial system was corrupt. Fortunately, we live in a country where almost every judge is a hardworking, honest person. Are, are we perfect? No. Do we make mistakes? No. That's why they, we, there are appeals. But by and large, the judges in our country are hardworking public citizens who do their best every day to fairly apply the facts and follow the law. And no one should be subjected to... Um, to threats against themselves, their family, their staff. It's wrong. It's un-American. And um, in my my personal view, anyone who who engages in that 
particularly if that person is a public official or a candidate, should be condemned and, in my opinion, uh, draws a question as to their legitimacy. And as Judge Calabrese said, you've been on the bench for quite some time now, since 1998. Can you talk over the arc of your career about the change when it comes to the climate and perception in your eyes of the judicial system, including any threats made against judges, lawyers, and jurors? Sadly, I think in recent years, uh, the climate has gotten worse. Um, it now seems to be okay to, to voice any, any hostile, angry, threatening thought that comes into one's head. It's okay to voice it. I certainly wasn't raised that way. Um, that's the climate we live in, and it affects all of us, and I'm, I'm, I'm dismayed by it. It's harder to be a judge now than it was when, when I came on in 98. Um, you know, we signed up for it, but we didn't sign up to be phys physically threatened or to worry about our family's safety. Judge Calabrese, last year you sentenced a Cleveland man to three years of probation, 100 hours of community service for threatening to kill former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. In your decision, you stated, Quote, this case shows the troubling state of civic discourse in our country. People will inevitably disagree with each other on important matters. Disagreements cannot spill over to violence or threats of violence, particularly to public officials. What do you make of this moment where you are seeing more instances of this harassment and violence targeted at public officials? Well, I do think uh, I agree with what my colleague had to say. I think it is increasing. Um, in its uh, frequency and its acceptance as a tactic. Uh, what I have seen is that it is unfortunately uh, be become very much a tactic. It's well-funded. Uh, it's done by uh, people uh, at times who are well-positioned, who are uh, public officials, and it does extend to uh, not just judges and justices, uh, but in many cases to their spouses uh, and family members as well. And I, and I agree, that should all be condemned. It should be um, out of bounds. I think one of the things we have to appreciate, and I've come to see uh, there's a, a critical lack of civics ed education in this country, and I think we need to understand what it is judges and the judicial system do as opposed to what uh, Congress or legislatures and executives do. Uh, what goes on, in my view, in the judiciary writ large is not politics by other means. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, our founders uh, uh, and the experience through our history uh, really underscore the importance and necessity for judicial independence uh, to make sure that our separation of powers and other rights that we enjoy under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the laws of the United States are uh, enjoyed by all citizens. If I, I could jump in. Please do, um, Judge it, Polster. I mean, this is Law Day, uh, May 1st, and I think that's why we're on. And um, everyone in our country should appreciate what we have and what a blessing it is. I mean, if you, if you travel around the world, um, a majority of countries in, this, in the world do not have a free and fair judiciary. I mean, in this country, if you have a dispute with anyone, another individual, a corporation, a government, you can go into court and have your case fairly decided under the law and the facts by an impartial judge. We take that for granted here. Most people in the world don't have that. Um, and we've had it for almost 250 years. We, we fought to get it. We fought to keep it. Uh, I certainly don't want to lose it. Uh, but we'll only keep that if if we we have good men and women who are willing to be served, and in, in, in this state, uh, state judges are all elected to to run for office. Federal judges are appointed, but men and women of uh, character, quality, integrity who are willing to serve and and perform that. But you know, we talk about the rule of law. I mean, it's as strong as the men and women who are sworn to uphold it and willing to serve. But um, Again, most most places in the world don't have it. 
Do you think, Judge Calabrese, that there is, you know, you talk about civics instruction and, and, and Judge Polster is talking about the context of American justice versus other places in the world where that's not a given. Uh, do you think there are ways to counter this current climate in which maybe your perception of the justice system is allowed to be swayed so uh, strongly by by politicians, by by rhetoric? Is there a way to counter that? Well, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I think there are a few things um, that that can be done. I, I, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, it's long been known, and I started by referencing the ethical r- rules that we as judges operate under. So we are not really in a position to defend ourselves in many ways. So we depend on um, others, other institutional actors, whether it's uh, uh, political leaders, uh, lawyers, bar associations, and the like. And one of the things I've seen in recent years is, uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, uh, bar associations willing to take sides in the debates and become political actors as opposed to even handedly mm-hmm. uh, denouncing attacks from whatever direction they come. And Judge Calabrese, I want to stay with you with this question. Some legal experts have said there is a dangerous, a danger in the rhetoric that someone out there who's on the internet watching may be mentally unstable. It may see the complaints on judges or their families as a call to action. Do you have a concern about that and kind of the the amplifying effect the internet has and in how messages might be inferred by someone um, as some sort of violent call to action? Well, look, none of us are above criticism. And I think, uh, as, as my colleague says, we, we're you know, you can agree with my decisions, disagree with them. I think what distinguishes uh, the judiciary is that uh, unlike the political branches, we typically give reasoned decisions rooted in uh, the law. Um, Sometimes you get that, you know, more political motivations and statements and the like, and that's appropriate for the other branches. Uh, But all the judiciary has, as Hamilton said in Federalist 78, is is reason. We don't have force or will. We just have reason. So that's ultimately what we rely on. Uh, So you need that robust public discourse about uh, what we're doing. So we're um, we're not above criticism in that regard. I think as a society, there's some very difficult issues we're all struggling with uh, in terms of how we deal with the Internet and social media and so forth. And uh, we'll we'll come to terms with all of that over time, I'm sure. Judge Polster, do you think there is any legitimacy in the public having complaints or concerns about bias by judges and how the legal system handles this? Well, we have, uh, Jenny, we have a system. If if a lawyer or a litigant feels that a judge in his or her case uh, has any sort of bias or partiality, they can file a motion to recuse. It's an established procedure. And uh, the judge looks at that carefully. And if the judge agrees, uh, thinks there's a concern, he or she recuses and another judge takes the case. And if the judge disagrees and denies the motion, well, that can be appealed generally. So th- there, there are established ways uh, if, if a lawyer or a litigant has any concern about a judge in a particular case. But to loosely th- throw around, say, so-and-so's crooked or, or, or corrupt or biased, uh, that's wrong. If you've got a specific uh, allegation based on facts, there's a way to make it, and you do it. Um, so uh, we, have, we have an established system for that, and I think it works very well. I mean, Judge one, Calabrese? Uh, one of the things I'll jump in and add on that, I agree with all of that, of course, but I think uh, a lot of times today uh, lawyers and litigants are quick Right. when they're on the losing end of a decision to immediately attack the legitimacy of the institution that rendered that decision. Um, uh, and I think in most cases, uh, that's uh, probably uh, almost all cases, uh, overwhelmingly irresponsible. And I think lawyers in particular should know better than that because there is a, uh, a sense in which lawyers have a duty uh, and a special privilege that we afford them uh, to uh, use their position to educate uh, the broader community in moments like that. And we certainly have had any number of cases over time that are very high profile and divisive in our society, and lawyers have done that 
And I, again, I, I will say from where I sit in my experience, I have seen far less of that in recent years uh, mm -hmm. than in our historical perspective. So I think there are opportunities to your earlier question uh, for us as a society uh, and for the legal profession to do better. I am speaking with two judges currently about the the state of respect and honor uh, for the judicial system and even concerns about uh, any sort of criticisms, harassment, or attacks on judges. I'm talking to the Honorable Dan Polster and the Honorable J. Philip Calabrese, uh, both working for the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. I'm curious, you know, in this day and age where you're talking about lawyers acting quickly, uh, people appealing to uh, the the court of public opinion as opposed to the courtroom, how difficult is it for you as judges to essentially block out the noise and stay adherent to what you say, reason, rule of law? Uh, I'll ask you that, Judge Polster. Well, it's a good question. I've had to do that over the last six plus years in my opioid multi-district litigation, mm. which has been handled in the public eye from the beginning. Um, I think that's one of the advantages of having life tenure. Uh, I know that you know whatever decision I make, some people will like it, some people won't. Maybe everyone will, will think I'm wrong. Uh, each of us has to do the best. Um, to focus on each case and uh, determine the facts fairly and apply the law and make the best decision we can and uh, again and then go to the next case and if we get reversed you know we fix the issue the judge the court of appeals says we need to fix and uh, as judge calabrese said we're, we're not politicians mm -hmm. all right when you walk into a, a courtroom anywhere in this country, you're not seeing a politician up there. Even if someone was elected, all right, his job is not, you know, he's not a politician in that case. His job and her job is to apply the, determine the facts fairly and apply the law and make the best decision that judge possibly can and, and uh, be fair to the lawyers and the parties. And I think overwhelmingly judges do in this country. I, I will say I think a lot of times there's a tendency in public debate and in conversations like this as well to focus on uh, the hard cases or the controversial ones. And the, the reality is I, I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but I did a couple of years ago. Americans are quite litigious. Uh, we have uh, a lot of lawsuits across the country, even just in federal court. Again, I forget the numbers. I know it's thousands of lawsuits filed uh, uh, across the country uh, in federal courts every year. The overwhelming majority of those are resolved at the district court level where uh, Judge Polster and I serve without an appeal, mm -hmm. um, which uh, uh, shows some- Well over 90%. Yeah, shows some degree of acceptance uh, by the parties of uh, those decisions. Right. Uh, and when cases are appealed, the overwhelming majority of appeals are uh, affirmed by three judge panels unanimously, mm -hmm. showing that there's general agreement uh, on what the rule of law requires. And so by definition, when we start getting into some of these conversations, we're talking about uh, cases that are outliers. Let's take a call from listener Jim calling in from Cleveland this morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, first off, I'd like to say I, agree, I I do not envy judges and elected officials during this time. It sounds very perilous. It sounds like the safety issues have clearly gone up, and that's very worrying, especially given what the judge was talking about in Guatemala and some other countries. I also agree that civics has to be more of more emphasized in schools. I also think that one of the reasons that we're in this situation is our elected officials in Columbus and in D.C. are not doing their job, so the courts have had to fill that void to varying degrees of approval. That all said, the idea that judges are not political was shown to be false, has been shown to be false by the Fifth Circuit Court's recent rulings, by the Supreme Court's recent rulings, not recent, even for the last decade. So I think we really do need to do away with this whole idea. I mean, I live here in Cuyahoga County. You see judges looking to get elected, and they say the Democratic-endorsed, Republican-endorsed. The, the, the idea that judges are not elected or they're, they're not political, uh, I, I think we need to do away with that. I don't think anyone's fooled anymore. And also, I would have to say that this starts from the top down. 
And the Supreme Court, we have to say, has been shown to be illegitimate at this point. You have two justices, Alito and Thomas, that are completely conflicted and should have recused themselves dozens of times over and never did. And that trickles down. Okay, and Jim, I, 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 I do appreciate your point. I think it's well taken. And, and I will turn this towards our judges. I mean, you know, so that's a that's a perception out there. And I do think it's not a, a, a minority perception um, when you look at some of the decisions ba- ma- ma- ba- made by the court system. But what would be your response to that, Judge Calabrese? Well, I, I completely disagree that the Supreme Court or any other court at this point has uh, become an illegitimate institution. And to me, it shows that the attacks work. I think if the attacks on the judiciary and judicial independence did not work, um, you would not see them continue, but I think opinions uh, like that are uh, evidence that it does, and they're effective, hmm. uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, and that's why I do think it's incumbent on uh, Judge Polster and I and others, lawyers, bar associations, and uh, all citizens to come together and to recognize um, uh, the legitimacy of these institutions because they're strong, they're bigger uh, than us. They will long outlast both of us, and we need them to uh, serve their constitutional functions. I could say uh, more. But. Yeah, I would just add on that. That's a, I appreciate your comments. The difference between a judge and a politician, even if the judge is elected in a, in a partisan election, when that judge decides a particular case, that judge is not making a political decision. That judge is looking at that case. If the judge has to determine the facts, you have an evidentiary hearing, you hear from the witnesses, you make credibility findings, you make the facts. You're applying the law, you look for binding authority in your circuit or Supreme Court or if it's state, the same thing. So you're making a legal decision, whether you were elected or appointed. And so that's the difference between a judge and a politician. With respect to the Supreme Court, I personally think the Supreme Court has created some of their own problems by exempting themselves from uh, some of the rules that apply to the rest of us. And I think that has created a, you know, an, an image problem with the Supreme Court, candidly, for those justices. But again, I th- believe they do the same thing when they have a case. They're not making a political decision. You may agree with it, you may disagree with it, but they're trying to interpret the Constitution and the laws uh, according to principles. And finally, Judge Calabrese, you know, building on what Judge Polster just said, how, again, you, you know, you, you said you don't have answers to how to rectify the public perception problem, but how do you continue to share awareness um, when it comes to perception of the court and that people from all striads of the community will get treated fairly? Well, I personally think it's incumbent upon uh, all of us to do what Judge Polster and I are doing today, is to get out and talk to people to meet them where they're at. Uh, That involves uh, some education uh, about what we do and how we go about our jobs. Uh, There's tremendous confusion, I find, about what judges do and the different court systems. Uh, We we do have a complex system, so to some degree that's understandable. But it also involves listening uh, to people like your caller and engaging with them. I do, although I disagree with the ultimate legitimacy point, I do um, take some of his earlier uh, issues and concerns I think he's right about. But um, I think I think just being uh, part of the community and not up in uh, some ivory tower where we're uh, not engaging with uh, our fellow citizens is is uh, a start. That's a great point, and uh, I have found this conversation enlightening. And if I could add thirty please, seconds, please do. I think please it's, do. Sorry, it's um, incumbent on all of us, particularly lawyers and judges. We were trained to to be able to disagree agreeably. And that is a critically important um, ability to have in a democracy. And I think we are, we are starting to lose that. We were all raised that way by our parents. You know, when we were kicking or bite, biting or screaming, our parents would say, use your words, all right? That's what they meant. So we all have the ability to do it, and we all need to do it a heck of a lot better if we want to keep our society together. Judge Dan Polster and Judge J. Philip Calabrese with the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. 
Uh, it's been a pleasure, and I thank you both for your time this morning. Thank you very much. It's thank privilege you. to be on. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and on the other end, we're going to talk about East Tech High School, home of Jesse Owens and other Olympic champions, and how they're restarting their track team after the COVID pandemic. I'm Jenny Hamill. This is The Sound of Ideas. We'll be right back. You're with The Sound of Ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for being with us this hour. We are less than 90 days away from the start of the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris. The United States has long found Olympic greatness in track and field, and Cleveland's East Tech High School can lay claim to two of the biggest track and field legends of all time, Jesse Owens and Harrison Dillard. Both won four medals each at the Olympics. Owens won his medals in 1936 in Berlin and along the way short-circuited Adolf Hitler's plans to use the games as a showcase for Aryan dominance. Dillard's greatness came in 1948 and 1952 after being inspired by Owens. Now, East Tech High School has leaned into that history to bring back its track team. The COVID pandemic knocked it out in 2020 when sports district-wide were canceled. Joining me now to talk about the return of the East Tech High School track team and the lasting legacy of Jesse Owens and Harrison Dillard and their inspiration for a new generation, I'm joined in studio by Michael Hardaway. He's the coach of the boys track team at East Tech. Welcome to you. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm good. Leroy Carter, campus coordinator at East Tech and the former athletic director. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Okay. And you just told me, but I hope I don't botch it, Zyke, Zyke Harris, the current student athlete at East Tech. It's great to have all of you in studio. Thank you, I always love a full house, and I can't wait to talk about this. If you have a question for any of our guests, like to join in the conversation, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Leroy, we're going to talk a bit about history. Let's talk about Jesse Owens and what made him such a legendary athlete on the field. And how does his legacy, do you think, extend to 2024, to today? Being a former athlete of East Tech High School, uh, hearing all of the great things about Jesse Owens growing up, uh, just inspired me to want to be an athlete like Jesse Owens. But his legacy still stands because uh, you still have uh, athletes across the world, across the country, that looks up to Jesse Owens as a role model. You know, you had Usain Bolt that just won gold medals in like the last three Olympics. You know, his main idol was Jesse Owens. You have some of the state champions uh, that came out of uh, the state of Ohio looked up at Jesse Owens as one of the uh, great athletes that everybody wanted to be a role model after. So his legacy to me will always stand as long as uh, track and field is around. And Leroy, you know, he was so great on field, but he endured so much off field, including even racism here at home. Mm -hmm. Yes, he uh, did a lot of great things. He was a part of a lot of um, boards, the Olympic Committee board, um, the high school, high school um, athletic uh, conference uh, committee. So he did a lot for just Cleveland alone that a lot of people don't know about. So Olympic year, it's, it's, it's a shame that they only talk about it during Olympic time of all of the things that he did. But he did things throughout his his whole life Mm -hmm. all right coach hardaway it it seems then almost unthinkable that east tech wouldn't have a track team given the history talk about how the team kind of dissolved during covid and how about your efforts to bring it back well um it was just tough on the boys side you know um leroy was just telling me like last year just the numbers weren't there you know we've been trying to recover after COVID, um, our girls, you know, he, he, he's been able to keep that program afloat. Um, but, you know, we struggle with the boys a little bit. So that was one thing. Um, when and when you say numbers, you mean the number of student athletes? Number of get? student okay. athletes on, on, on the boys track team. Um, so, you know, when I was hired as the boys uh, football coach, you know, I wanted to take on the, the track assignment. Um, and we've been, you know, getting better interest. I think we got about 13 or 14 boys. Uh, involved on the track team right now. 
And how much do you think about Jesse Owens just kind of as a part of the spirit of, of, of East Tech and, and, and the legacy that he leaves? Every day. Um, I, you know, the boys probably would, Zakir probably would tell you that I, I, I spoke on the legacy of Jesse Owens way back during football season. It's very important to me. Um, every day that I walk the halls of East Tech, I think about him. But I, I, I stand in awe that he really walked, maybe not that same building, but he walked the halls of East Tech High School. And it's just an honor uh, to even be the head coach of East Tech Track with just the legacy of uh, Jesse Owens and Harrison Dillard. Um, so it's something that I take real serious. Zyke, you're on the team. So how is it being a part of this comeback? And does the Olympic legacy and the stories of – Jesse Owens and and Harrison Dillard, do they play in your mind? It do. It, it's really amazing because it's just something new to me, and that I just gives me more time to hang around my friends and just get better event like get better at running and things like that. So, how much do you like running and running fast? <laughs> <laughs> I like it very much. Like I like it real bad. Like when I'm running, it just everything is just clear, and it's a lot more easier for me to just cope with every, anything. I love that. It clears your mind. I think a lot of runners would agree with that. Uh, are there uh, specific uh, track meets or, you know, categories that you're doing? Yeah, I do um, 100 meter, 200, a 4 by one a 4 by 2 And Coach Hardaway, how, how's Zyke looking? Is he getting faster he, and faster? He's getting better um, mm -hmm. every week. You know, we just stay on top of him, um, you know, to become a, a better student athlete. It's always better in himself every day. So, you know, him being a freshman, you know, we you know hope to have him for the next four years. And um, we expect some great things from him, um, both on the academic side and both athletically. So, you know, continuing to get better as a young man every day. And Zaki, I got to ask, you know, obviously athletics is super important. You say get, you get to hang out with your friends and clear your mind and be a part of something important. And I would assume the structure is good, too. Uh, how does it help you in other aspects of your life, participating in sports, uh, you know, when you're not at school or with your, your academics? Well, it keeps me out the street doing bad things or any other type of ungood activity. And I, me doing track, it just makes me want to tell all my other friends come do track instead of just being in the streets and acting crazy and wild. You know, and I understand, uh, Leroy, that I was reading some history on Jesse Owens. I mean, he had it tough growing up, and, mm -hmm. and, and they, they were coming out of the Great Depression and all of those things. And really, for Jesse Owens, it seemed like finding track and field was an escape mm -hmm. and was a chance at, at, at a whole new world. And I read that ultimately he was the only one who actually stuck it out in high school because his brothers and sisters had to quit school to work to help their family so really it was a saving grace for him yes and i just uh recently found out that he didn't even receive a scholarship for uh ohio state he had to work mm. still you know to pay for his education at ohio state it, you know he came from uh, uh you know a hard come up from you know coming from alabama with I think he was one of nine I think yeah. brothers and sisters, so. so he had a lot to um to bring to the family. You know his uh, brothers worked at the steel mill, his dad, and they gave him a chance to to run. He uh when he didn't run, he was uh, working. Mm -hmm. So the coach uh he 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 uh, also says his middle school coach is who he credited for his career. That's right. Because he was the one that uh, let Jesse Owens work and then either practice before or after uh, work or school or whatever. So he gives him a lot of credit for uh, him being the person that he is. It's amazing when one person sees promise in another and yeah. cultivates that, you know, mm -hmm. what can happen. If anyone has a, a story they want to share about their thoughts on Jesse Owens and the Olympic greats or East Tech High, call in 866-578-0903, or you can email us at soi at ideastream.org. Now, Coach, I'd love to know, what's your hope for the team? And, and, and you know, you're just kind of getting started. Um, you've got time to cultivate. But what's your hope for what you guys can achieve in the short term? Um, well, you know, some of our goals are we want to be city champions again. Um, you know, we look up on the wall every day. 
and we look at the history of East Tech Track, it, it's, it's a very story program. So the pressure is on. Mm -hmm. um, our expectation is with this group in the next uh, one to two years is that, you know, we're qualifying for the state meet in Columbus. We understand there's steps that we have to take to get there. Uh, we need to win our city and be strong in it. We need to win our district and win our regional. Um, and then we can make it to Columbus. So we understand that it's a work in progress. We're looking for all of the guys uh, to get better this summer if they're not doing work or football. We ex we're expecting them to run with some um, some different track programs in the area. And, and Zyke, how are you preparing for all of this? I mean, it, it, what's your re running regimen look like? <laughs> um, I do my 35-minute jog around the track field, anything. So I just try to stay, keep myself fit and ready for anything. And are you working in the gym? I mean, do you, is there a weights component to any of this? Yes. Yes. And how is uh, your your eating regimen? Are you eating healthy? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's something that, it, it, you know, that's something that we're talking to our boys about and we're trying to uh, get some better nutritional options for them uh, on a daily. So that's something that, you know, we're working to bring to them as well. So sure. that's something with young people talking about dieting, it can get tough sometimes. Um, so we just trying to work on the hydration process right now. Oh, good for you. And that protein, those veggies. Yes. But I know a, a Big Mac will just fade right <laughs> off you. So they're like, I'm going to McDonald's. <laughs> Let's take a call from Ishmael in Akron. Ishmael, good morning. Go ahead. Good morning. How are you? We're doing well. What's your thought? Hey, I, um, my, yeah, my name is Ishmael El Amin, and um, I am a film director and producer, and I just produced an up-and-coming ESPN 30 for 30 film on uh, – on Akron's own Butch Reynolds. Nice. Uh, and it's airing on ESPN on June 11th. But I wanted, I just wanted to say, because I, I just love this conversation, because if you watch the film, Butch talked about, you know, chills to this day, you know, Jesse Owens being the greatest uh, Olympic athlete of all time. And, and it's the reason why Butch went to Ohio State in the first place. And I, and I, think, and I think that, you know, Jesse just doesn't get his due in regards of the legacy that he left in track and field. But I just I just wanted to commend you guys to this conversation. Well, Ishmael, Thank that... You. Thank you, Ishmael. Yeah, appreciate that call. And Leroy, you're, you're nodding your head. Do you think he doesn't get his due? Not enough credit at all. And that's that's uh, expiring because we actually have uh, our sports legends of Cleveland now. And uh, Butch Reynolds was actually there at the first induction and he gave the speech for Harrison Dillard, a former Olympian of East Tech also. So Butch uh, said in his uh, speech that uh, Jesse Owens and Harrison Dillard was the two that really inspired him to uh, become the great athlete that he is. I actually ran against uh, Butch Reynolds in college. No. Yes, yes, How yes, did you yes. do? Uh, I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> him and his brother. Where's your 30, 30 for 30? <laughs> yes, him and his brother, ran, we ran a 4x4 four four against them in Arizona. So That's incredible. Great, great, great athlete. You know, Butch is another one of those ones that, you know, expired a you know, my age group to to be great runners, another Olympian, you know, out of the state of Ohio. Now you carry it forward. So, Zyke, we're, we're running out of time, but but do you have aspirations for greatness on the field? Yes, I do. Like, I just dream of it, and I just feel like I got to go make that happen. And you work hard to do it. Definitely. So, Coach, uh, we, we've got about 30 seconds left, but it must be exciting to work with these young individuals. And you don't know, you know, you might have them for four years, but you shape kind of what they, they're going to be like for the rest of their lives. It's my inspiration. Uh, they inspired me as much as I inspire them. It's the reason why, you know, when things get tough, I just keep going. They, they motivate me through a lot of things. Um, I want to see them go on and do well, even if it's not in the realm of sports. We, we want to set these young men up for, and these young women in our program up for success. So that, that, that's our main thing. We want to bring out the best in them. Um, as a student athlete, we want to see them continue to grow as people. Coach Michael Hardaway, Zyke Harris, and L Leroy Carter of East Tech High School, my thanks to all of you. Thank Great you to see you this morning. Me. Thank you.
As we mentioned in the conversation, Harrison Dillard also had his track and field start at East Tech. After being inspired by Jesse Owens, Dillard went on to win gold in 1948 and 52. He's the only person to ever win gold medals in the 100-meter dash and the 110-meter hurdles. Former Sound of Ideas host and producer Rick Jackson got a chance to sit down and talk to Dillard back in 2018, one year before he passed away. We should note, as Rick Jackson was preparing to retire last year, we asked him about his favorite interview. And without missing a beat, Rick said, talking to Harrison Dillard. That gives me chills. Well, here's their conversation from back in 2018. I was there because uh, I'd had a dream that began when I was 13 years old. Harrison Dillard grew up in Cleveland, like many young boys of the day idolizing two larger-than-life African-American sports stars, boxer Joe Lewis and Olympian Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens, the Buckeye Bullet, stepped into his destined role as he streaked down the red cinder path in the 100-meter dash to win in the phenomenal time of 10 and 2 fifths seconds, breaking all existing world records. But Owens was more than a star on screen. He was from the neighborhood, from East Tech, the same high school Dillard would attend. Dillard set state records in high school. Later, he won the NCAA and AAU 120-yard and 220-yard hurdles in both 1946 and 1947, matching world records at the time. And he became the only Olympic athlete in history to win golds in both the sprints and hurdles. But you know that, or you should. So let's skip to that moment 70 years ago, standing on a podium in London and hearing the Star Spangled Banner. I remember vividly when we were presented the medal, the gold medal, and I stood on that stand and uh, they played the national anthem and uh, the flag was slowly raised. And I said, wow. I said, I'm standing just where, where Jesse stood, what, a dozen years before I had that dream. I read where you said that hair in the back of your neck stood up, up as you yeah. listened to the American right. anthem played. Mm -hmm. What was that like? There's nothing like it. <laughs> and I, I guess uh, having been a soldier uh, not too many years before, and especially the fact that I was a grunt, you know, I was in, in 92nd Infantry, uh, I was a foot soldier, so all, all those things just kind of came rushing back as I stood there and watched that flag go up. Talk to me about being in the war. You saw combat, and in many cases, though, you went to places where white soldiers could do one thing, but your battalion, black soldiers, couldn't. That, that had to be painful. You're serving the country, and you can't be yeah, on there, it. There, there was one incident that uh, comes to mind. Uh, this was in Italy where we served, and it was almost the end of the war. I think the war ended about three weeks later, and went through this little mountain village. And uh, prior to that, any place that we went, people would come out and welcome us. But this little particular mountain village, when we went through, all the uh, windows were covered over, the drapes were pulled, and uh, we didn't see the people. So we wondered. A couple of guys could speak a little Italian, and they asked them what, uh, que pas, you know, and uh, they said, well, they'd been told that the narrow soldati, the black soldiers, that they would mistreat the women and, and, and the children. So who told you that? And they said, the American soldiers told us that. And at the same time, we're fighting right next to each other. That's the, you know, the unusual part of it. That battalion of black soldiers he referenced was the famed 92nd Infantry Division, sometimes called the Buffalo Soldiers, an all-black unit often credited with helping turn the tide in Italy. Because U.S. armed forces were segregated, men of the 92nd Infantry were the only black unit in Europe of more than 900,000 African Americans who served in World War II. Dillard is one of the last remaining heroes of that group. You discount the idea of being a hero, but because of doing the things you did when you did them, you realize why people look at you as an American hero. Well, yeah, when, when you stop, and in retrospect, I guess, uh, when you can kind of put it uh, in context and think of the things that happened and what some people view as, as a hero, then it, it makes a little more sense then. But when you're going through it, boy, all you want to do is get it over with and get, get out of there. there. 
That humility is evident by what you see in his home. Prominent are the Olympic torches he later carried to support others, one he ran with in Cleveland as the flame went to Los Angeles in 1984, the other he carried commemorating the Salt Lake City Games in 2002. There are proclamations from mayors, and there are a few trophies, including his favorite. A few years ago, uh, I got voted into the IAAF, that's the International mm -hmm. Hall of Fame, track and field. That which means all time, no matter who. And this is my favorite. <laughs> what you don't see displayed is the gold. We had to nearly beg to see his Olympic medals from 66 and 70 years ago. His most noted achievements, they were boxed and put away. A little different than nowadays. <laughs> now they're on colorful ribbons and they put them on your neck. Does it surprise you that people still make as much a fuss over what you did some 70 years later? In many ways it does, but at, at the same time, uh, it's the Olympic Games, and I guess because of their significance, it uh, has a, little, a lot of interest for many people. Does it still, in a way, seem like yesterday to you when you were running? Not quite. <laughs> I wish I could uh, compress 70 years into yesterday, but... Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm well aware of the, you know, the great length of time. A change that he sees as having put emphasis on things greater than just running fast, jumping high, as the newspaper clippings and photos attest that he did so much better than so many others. What do you think of today's athletes that are, you know, taking a stand and whether it's kneeling during the anthem or whether it's speaking out about uh, police brutality, what do you think of the way that today's athletes are not just athletes? I, I commend them. I think they're doing something that's necessary and uh, in time, I think when enough people, when a majority of uh, our citizenship realizes what these guys are doing, that uh, they'll be looked upon as heroes too. As he is looked up to now. Baldwin Wallace University still hosts the Harrison Dillard Indoor City Track Championships. His statue stands on the campus where he achieved his first national notoriety before and after his military service. His life of service to others continued. Following graduation, he eventually found his way to the Cleveland schools, where he was a vital part of the administration for 27 years and loved the work. Still loves track and field, too. What do you think of today's athletes? Tyson Gay, Usain Bolt, the guys who are running and setting times and speeds that you never could have imagined. Well, uh, I sometimes wonder what would happen if I could compete uh, under the same conditions, if I could have, how, how much better I could have been. Uh, obviously, I could have been better. We all could have been better. But with the advances in medicine and knowledge and training techniques, uh, that was just a, a natural improvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, the human race gets better as, as time goes. And these guys are evidence of it. They're proof, living proof. You still like to sit and watch track meets? I still watch. I still watch. And I said, wow, that guy can run. <laughs> <laughs> that was former Idea Stream host and producer Rick Jackson in conversation with Olympic gold medalist Harrison Dillard back in 2018. We'll have a link to that conversation and video piece on today's website. And Idea Stream's Gabe Kramer has a terrific feature on the return of the East Tech High School track team. You can hear that this afternoon on All Things Considered. Now, to get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter now, X, at Sound of Ideas. You can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore or on Instagram at Jenny Hamill Idea Stream. Tomorrow on the Sound of Ideas, we'll discuss the pro-Palestinian protests that have sprung up on colleges and university campuses around the country. And we'll hear the response to those protests with local and national reporters. And we'll talk to an eyewitness of the May 4th shootings at Kent State ahead of that tragic event's 54th anniversary this weekend. Also, the next Sound of Ideas community tour is happening next Thursday, May 9th at 6 p.m. at the Cleveland History Center. We'll be talking about the wealth and power here in Northeast Ohio. Who holds power? How did they obtain it? And you can you come to power without wealth? Again, that's next Thursday at 6 p.m. at the Cleveland History Center. Find out more and register at ideastream.org slash community tour. Now, if you missed any portion of the program, you can find us online 
or you can stream the Sound of Ideas podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also hear a rebroadcast of tonight of today's show tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll speak with you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.